provide the most expensive parts of the spacecraft, and that in turn drives down the cost of space access. So while Dragon today is a new vehicle, there are a handful of components flying that have seen some space before, the heat shield structure just being one example. Now, speaking of new technologies, the astronauts on board the International Space Station are eagerly awaiting this next delivery of science to keep them busy on the world's only orbiting laboratory. We had a chance to catch up with a couple of them to hear about the work they've been doing since they arrived safely on the Crew 2 mission back in April. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the International Space Station. I'm Aki Hoshide, and uh, we're here doing Expedition 65 and I'm uh, Megan MacArthur, one of the flight engineers for the mission, and you probably know we have a cargo mission coming up real soon, SpaceX 22, and I'm excited to see what that's going to be like. I think it's going to affect our pace and everything that we've got going on. Aki, you've seen this before. You captured actually the first uh, cargo resupply mission from Dragon about nine years ago, so tell me what was that like? Yeah, nine years ago. That's <laughs> a long, long time ago. Well, that was my first uh, time to actually capture a cargo vehicle with a robotic arm, and so it was a horrifying two minutes, you know, <laughs> holding my breath and trying to capture it without uh, making any mistakes. This cargo dragon will be actually a little bit different, so what's different about this one? This time it's ju just going to dock, so without the help of the robotic arm, it's going to uh, automatically dock to the International Space Station. And of course, it will be similar to our crewed vehicle that we came up in, so everything should look pretty much the same. Yeah. Just there won't be people, there'll be, uh, there'll be cargo and a lot of science experiment. Some of the science samples will arrive in powered payload lockers, so they can be frozen temperatures. But some of the samples will arrive in this cooler type of uh, bag, which is called a double cold bag. It's a super insulated bag and we put ice bricks in there along with the samples to keep them at the right temperature. So I'll show you what that looks like. Oh, looks like we have a stowaway. Whoa. These are the ice bricks and they can maintain a temperature um, between minus 32 and plus 37 Celsius. They're, uh, they're just room temperature right now or I wouldn't be holding them with bare hands. But you can see we would fill that up with the um, ice bricks uh, as well as the samples. We also send samples home this way, um, and they have a certain amount of time that they will stay at temperature before they're recovered by the team on the ground. You know I'm excited about the tardigrades. Oh, I told yeah. you about the water bears, super excited about that. They're little microscopic creatures that can survive in extreme environments. And the, um, the Cell Science 4 experiment is looking at um, how, like what can we see by looking at their genes? How do they survive and adapt to extreme environments? And then the hope is that that information can be used to, um, to look at stress factors in humans when, when we're living in space. Another one I think is really exciting um, that has benefits both for us in space but also on Earth is a new ultrasound experiment, uh -huh. uh, the butterfly ultrasound, and it's looking at portable ultrasound technology with mobile tech. Uh -huh. Some really exciting stuff that kind of covers a big spectrum. Yeah. was NASA astronaut Megan MacArthur and JAXA astronaut Aki Hoshide aboard the International Space Station. And welcome into the International Space Station Flight Control Room at the Johnson Space Center here in Houston, Texas. The team of flight controllers in Mission Control Houston today is being led by Flight Director Rebecca Wingfield. The teams here in Mission Control will really jump into action tomorrow night into Saturday morning as Cargo Dragon approaches the International Space Station and enters the approach ellipsoid, which we like to think of as an imaginary sphere around the space station that helps us monitor the approach and departure of visiting vehicles. There are currently seven crew members living and working aboard the International Space Station. Expedition 65 consists of NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough, Megan MacArthur, and Mark Vandehei, Rose Cosmos cosmonauts Pyotr Dubrov and Oleg Novitsky, Aki Hoshide of JAXA, and Thomas Pasquet of the European Space Agency. One major component flying in Dragon's trunk today is the first pair of Boeing-made iRosa solar arrays, which will be installed to the 2B and 4B channels of the P6 truss by Thomas Pasquet and Shane Kimbrough over two spacewalks planned for June 16th and June 20th. This will be the first of three deliveries of these iRosa solar arrays. There will be six in all to upgrade and augment the power for the six of eight power channels on the station. 
As Crew Dragon approaches the International Space Station in the morning hours on June 5th, NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur will be monitoring the arrival from the station's cupola. And once Dragon arrives to the station, it will dock to the Zenith port on the space-facing side of the station's Harmony module and will join four other spacecrafts, Crew Dragon, Cygnus 15, the Soyuz MS-18, and Progress 77. Cargo Dragon will remain attached to the International Space Station for about one month before being packed up with critical science and supplies and will splash down in the Atlantic Ocean for that science to be analyzed back here on Earth. Again, everything is still a go from here in Mission Control Houston, and we're looking forward to welcoming another vehicle to the International Space Station. So for now, we'll head back out to Kennedy. Megan. It is now T-minus eight minutes and counting until liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket and Cargo Dragon on the next resupply mission to the International Space Station. Now, you heard Courtney just mention the new solar arrays again. So let's take some time to go more in depth about those because they're really important to the station and what happens there. Take a look at your screen now. This is the first first pair of the new Boeing made ISS rollout solar arrays known as IROSA. They are made up of compact panels you see there that roll open like a huge yoga mat, 63 by 20 feet each. Here they are inside the space station processing facility at the Kennedy Space Center before being packed inside Dragon. The space station currently has eight pairs of solar arrays. The oldest pair has been in use for more than 20 years. The two new solar arrays plus four more to be delivered later will produce a total of more than 120 kilowatts of electricity. That is enough to power more than 40 U.S. homes. Once combined with the eight original arrays, the new ones will boost power to the station up to 30 percent, maximizing use for the orbiting lab for many years to come. And these new two new solar arrays, like Courtney said, are going to be installed this summer. Now let's head back over to Shiva for an update. Shiva. Thanks, Megan. Uh, we're just over T minus seven minutes to go. The SpaceX team currently working no significant issues with the vehicles. At this point, rocket propellant one fuel is nearly fully loaded on the first stage, completely loaded on the second stage. Liquid oxygen loading is underway on both of the stages as well, and that'll complete at about T minus two minutes to launch. We're also loading helium gas into both of the stages. Falcon 9 uses helium as a pressurant, that's to backfill the propellant tanks as we consume liquid oxygen and RP1 by the Merlin engines during ascent. A helium loading began before the webcast went live, and we'll continue to top it off until about a minute and a half before launch. Now, to make sure that the engine startup goes well, we also perform what's called engine chill. It started at about T minus seven minutes. We flow a small amount of that super chilled liquid oxygen into the Merlin engine turbo pumps, and we do that to avoid thermal shock to the mechanical components once we get that full flow of super chilled liquid oxygen on engine start. Dragon also began its startup sequence at T minus 35 minutes when it coordinated timing with the Falcon 9. It's currently undergoing a set of vehicle health Maybe checks with complete. its next major milestone happening just before liftoff when it'll transition to internal battery power. Now the range is standing by ready to support today's mission. Launch weather is continuing to, continuing to trend favorably. Uh, we had a 60% chance of go and we're still continuing to monitor some of those clouds and precipitation in the area. So with that, the launch team of Falcon 9, Dragon, the range all looking good, weather also trending good, and at about T minus five minutes to go, I'm now joined by Marie to help me walk through these final moments of the terminal count. Marie? Yeah, Shiva, as you said, weather um, trending in the better direction. Uh, it was a little bit, uh, a little bit hairy for a couple minutes there. Um, within the last, oh, I want to say maybe 13 minutes or so, it was right around T minus uh, 19 or 18 minutes. We heard about some lightning strikes in the area, not coming within that 10 mile radius of the pad, uh, but that was a watch item. It looks like um, they're not expecting uh, lightning to be an issue to come that close. Um, and that cell that I mentioned to the south of the pad looks Dragon like- Dragon uh, has transitioned to, to configure for terminal count. Uh, between that a little bit more separation. Dragon has transitioned to terminal count and is on internal power. Okay, so we heard that call that Dragon is now on internal power. Um, again, as, as Shiva mentioned, the team has already conducted uh, its pre-launch engine chill. Again, uh, this is when SpaceX injects a small amount of super chilled liquid oxygen to prepare those Merlin engines inside the first stage uh, to allow for full propellant flow during flight. And 
and we can hear the uh, hissing from some of that liquid oxygen venting off the side of the rocket as it meets that uh, Strong warm. on back retract in progress. We, we just heard the call out there as well uh, for strong back retract. The strong back is the truss structure next to Falcon 9 that provides propellants and power to the vehicle. So you can see the clamp arms are opening around the second stage and uh, the strong back will retract a couple of degrees away from the vertical position, helping to clear the way for Falcon 9's ascent. In these last few minutes, Falcon 9 is performing a set of health checks on its primary communications, avionics, and propulsion systems in preparation for flight. We'll continue to hear callouts if the engines are sufficiently chilled in and for some of these milestones that are coming up next. And there you can see the uh, strong back starting its retraction away from the vertical position. And so we saw uh, that strong back or transport erector uh, retract uh, ever so slightly from the Falcon 9 rocket. It will uh, retract fully. Uh, Pogo bleed verification. Just as we get to the moment of liftoff to allow uh, for Falcon 9 to clear the pad. Um, also happening now are some checks of the second stage thrust vector control actuators. Uh, that is often referred to as an engine wiggle test. And this is when SpaceX moves the thrust stage nozzles. One, and we just heard the call for uh, the stage one locks load complete. Again, that uh, engine wiggle test happening uh, now to make sure that the guidance hardware is go for flight. SpaceX will do the exact same checkouts on the first stage engines, and that will happen just a few seconds before ignition. Yeah, and we just heard that call out for first stage locks load complete. Uh, next major activity here will be second stage locks load complete. Usually happens around the T minus two minute mark, and that wraps up propellant loading for Falcon 9 until liftoff. Dragon also continuing to perform final health checks. Stage to make two sure locks load complete. Its systems, to make sure all of its systems are ready to go for Dragon uh, is ascent in auto and idle. rendezvous with the International Space Station. Weather continuing to trend favorably as Dragon transitions into its uh, ascent state. Weather remaining uh, go as we are approaching the T minus one minute mark when Dragon will transition to internal power. Falcon 9's in startup. Dragon is in countdown. LD, go for launch. For launch director. Launch director pulled Stage go for launch. For so, with, so with that, all systems are currently go for just over T minus 30 seconds to lift off. T minus 30 seconds. And at T0, the rocket will be released from the hold down clamps at the pad. And as I mentioned earlier, that strong back right next to the to the rocket will retract the rest of the way, clearing the way for lift off. Stage one, press for flight. T minus 15 seconds. Falcon 9 is configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Lift off. And lift off of the 22nd SpaceX cargo resupply mission, bringing new solar arrays to the International Space Station. Stage 1 proportion is nominal. T plus 
almost 40 seconds into flight. Awesome shot looking Power back. Power telemetry at, nominal. Uh, the Cape, our Falcon 9, has launched. We're coming up on the next major milestone. That's the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure. That's when the Open stresses on the vehicle will be the highest. Execute. So in preparation for maximum aerodynamic pressure, we throttle down those Merlin 1D engines. Now that we're through that point, we'll continue to we'll throttle back up and continue on to the next of our sequence of events. We have several happening in rapid succession. That'll be main engine cutoff, followed by a stage separation. Then we'll have a first stage flip maneuver, second engine start number one, and then a boost back burn on the first stage. Now, main engine cutoff, or MECO, that's where all nine of the Merlin 1D engines on the first stage will shut down. That's followed shortly after by stage separation, when both the first and back, second stages chilling. will separate. From there, the first stage will flip to prepare itself for entry. A few seconds later, the Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage will ignite to boost the Dragon into a low Earth orbit. That's called SES-1. And then finally, on the first stage, we'll have boost back burn start to slow down the first stage in preparation for re-entry. So again, those five events, Miko, stage separation, first stage flip maneuver, second engine start, and then the boost back burn all coming up just in under 10 seconds from now. And Miko. Stage separation confirmed. In the ignition. Stage one boost back startup. So successful Merlin vacuum engine startup. First stage has begun its boost back burn. That burn expected to last about uh, 30 or so seconds. Here's a shot of the second stage Merlin vacuum nozzle. You can see it starting to heat up as we begin this burn. The second stage will continue to burn here for several minutes until about the T plus eight minute mark. Stage one, boost back, shut down. If you're just joining us, welcome. If you're watching a live webcast for the 22nd commercial resupply mission to the International Space Station for NASA. This is SpaceX's 17th launch of the year, and we are flying a cargo configuration of our new Dragon spacecraft. On the right-hand side of your screen is the second stage, which is carrying the Dragon spacecraft into orbit. On the left-hand side of your screen, you can see Falcon 9's first stage with the grid fins extending. It just completed its boost back burn and is making its way back to our drone ship. Now, the rocket has to do more than just go up. It has to go sideways really fast. That liftoff gravity is pulling straight down on the rocket, but as we ascend, we tilt the, the engines, that's called gimbling, and that begins to turn the rocket horizontally. We're still going up, but we're also heading horizontally away from the launch pad. That maneuver is called a gravity turn. The rocket typically needs to go about 7.5 kilometers per second, or about 17,500 miles an hour, to avoid being pulled back down to Earth and to get into orbit. So that's what the second stage is doing right now. Now, the first stage, in order to make its way back to our drone ship, named, of course, I Still Love You, it has two more burns to do. First is an entry burn. It'll ignite three of its Merlin 1 engines. That'll help to slow it down as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. And then the next activity will happen much closer to the drone ship. That is a, the landing burn. will ignite just the single center Merlin engine to bring the vehicle speed rapidly down to zero. You can see the grid fins that are extended on the left-hand side of your screen. We use those for atmospheric control. They help steer the Falcon 9 to make sure we make our way back to that drone ship as we get into the thicker parts of the Earth's atmosphere. And you'll occasionally see periodic uh, bursts of a white gas uh, like that. That's our attitude control system, giving us little corrections to our attitude. The so next major event coming up here for the first stage is entry burn. Three of the Merlin 1D engines will ignite. Second stage burn continuing to look nominal. Second stage has a little ways to go. It won't be done with this burn until about the T plus eight minute mark.
stage one FTS is saved. Trajectory nominal. Stage one entry burn startup. So with that, three Merlin 1D engines on the first stage igniting to reduce the vehicle's velocity. You can see that on the bottom left corner of your scene screen. This burn expected stage to last one about entry burn shut down. So from here, the grid fins will continue to take the first stage towards our drone ship stationed out in the Atlantic Ocean. At this point, T plus six and a half minutes into flight, second stage is making its way to the initial orbit to drop off the Cargo Dragon spacecraft. And uh, if you're just joining us, welcome. On your screen is a live view of Falcon 9's first stage on the left, the second stage on the right. We had a, an on-time liftoff at 1.29 p.m. Eastern time Nominal ascent so far. Now, talking a little bit more about stage the one transonic. Talking a little bit more about the first stage. So the next major event coming up is that landing burn. Landing burn is what will bring the vehicle speed rapidly down to zero. Amazing shots stage of the first stage during re-entry. Once we get closer to the drone ship, we will deploy our four symmetric landing legs around the base of the first stage for hopefully a nice soft touchdown on that drone ship. You can see a shot of that on the right-hand side of your screen. Stage one landing leg deploy. Picture-perfect landing of that Falcon 9 for the first one stage. Landing. First landing for this first stage. 86 successful recovery overall for SpaceX. Fantastic. Now, coming up shortly, second stage is not done. It will be coming up on a second engine cutoff. Terminal guidance. About 30, uh, excuse me, under 30 seconds from now. It's been burning that whole time since stage separation to bring the 7,000 pounds of cargo into the initial orbit around our planet. And you can stage see we're, we're getting close to orbital velocity. Go. Shutdown of the second stage engine from here. We'll be looking at telemetry. Make sure we are in the intended orbit. Nominal orbit insertion. Fantastic. So with that, the second stage has just one major task left. It is commanding separation of the Dragon spacecraft just a few minutes from now. Until separation, the second stage will be making some small adjustments during this coast prior to Dragon separation. And we're hoping, we're hoping to have video, there's some video, into the unpressurized cargo section of Dragon. This video from the top of the second stage. We got a good look there at the new rollout solar arrays that Cargo Dragon is bringing to the International Space Station. So separation of the Dragon spacecraft expected at about T plus 12 minutes. We have a little bit of a coast here for ground operators in mission control behind me to ensure that the vehicle is in the right configuration, that there's no uh, conditions that we may want to watch out for after separation. But Dragon and the Stage 2 right now in orbit. And coming up after that separation, uh, event, which hopefully we'll get a view like this of Dragon gently floating away, the Dragon spacecraft will begin to perform some of its own checkouts. Dragon is equipped with 12 service section Draco thrusters that are used primarily for attitude control and proximity next to the space station. It's also got four Draco thrusters on the top of the vehicle underneath its nose cone that we use for our uh, thrust maneuvers to help us rendezvous with the International Space Station. So 
So again, successful ascent, successful recovery of our first stage just a few minutes ago. You're looking at a live shot into the Cargo Dragon uh, unpressurized section from the second stage that is in orbit around our planet. Our next major activity coming up shortly, that is Dragon separation from Falcon 9's second stage. Something a little bit different about uh, this Dragon spacecraft. If uh, you followed our first version of Dragon, you'd know that uh, it had deployable solar arrays. This version of Dragon has conformal solar arrays on the body of the spacecraft. So those are mounted along the exterior panel of the trunk that we're looking into right now. Those provide power for the spacecraft as it makes its way to the space station. Dragon separation confirmed. Lovely planet Earth on the left-hand side. Dragon floating away. You can see the rollout solar arrays from this view atop Falcon 9 second stage, watching Dragon gently float away. So again, activities coming up for Dragon. It will begin its service section Draco checkouts, followed shortly after that by a no, the nose cone Expect loss of signal uh, yeah. opening. And uh, that's going to complete my coverage here from Hawthorne. But why don't we check in with Courtney at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Courtney? Thanks, Shiva. Again, just standing by for that nose clone deploy. The nose cone deploy uncovers the four forward bulkhead thrusters, which Dragon will use for its major burn maneuvers coming up. and nose cone hooks are driving now. And the hooks are halfway open, again standing by for them to be fully open. Again, standing by for nose cone deploy. That nose cone will stay open in the position until the very end of the mission. And the first set of nose cone hooks are open, and the second set are starting to open now.
Again, once the nose cone is open, it will stay in that position until the very end of its mission, closing prior to reentry to provide some additional protection to some hardware during reentry. Expected loss of signal, Newfoundland. Again, standing by for confirmation of nose cone deploy. And this nose cone deploy will uncover those four bulkhead thrusters, and that's what Dragon will use for its major burns coming up throughout the next day to catch up with this space station before docking. Acquisition signal, Gunhilly. And the nose cone is opening. And nose cone deploy confirmed. And with nose cone deploy now confirmed, now joining me on the phone is manager of the International Space Station Office for Systems Engineering and Integration, Jeff Arend. Jeff, one major component in Dragon's trunk today is the first set of IROSA solar arrays. Can you tell us the importance of augmenting the station's power supply through these IROSA spacewalks later this month? Absolutely, Torton. Uh, how do you hear me? Perfect. I hear you great. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm going to kind of start at the beginning a little bit because the punchline at the end is probably the best. But, um, you know, over time, our, our solar rays age. And uh, so the first set of arrays have, uh, have been up there over 20 years. Uh, our most recent uh, arrays we brought up, you know, just before shuttle retirement. Those arrays are uh, over 10 years old as well. And then the set in between are, are closer to 15 years old. Um, so over time, uh, the arrays aren't as efficient at generating power. Um, so that's that's one of the things we wanted to fix with the with the augmentation. Um, so when we actually the first two we do are the oldest arrays, which makes sense. The two, first two that we replace, and that will effectively restore those arrays back to what we would call their beginning of life properties. Um, and in the case of the newer arrays. You know the ones that are 10 to 15 years old that are, that will eventually get the the uh, irosas. They'll actually be able to generate more power than they than they can today. Um, so this pro this provides basically three significant benefits. I kind of alluded to the to one of the two, which uh, but let me let me kind of go through in order here for in in my logical mind. Um, so for one, for our solar array constrained events, it makes it easier for us to manage the solar arrays. Uh, an example of that would be about what we're going to see tomorrow. So visiting vehicle dockings and undockings, you know, the arrays can't always point at the sun. We have to protect them from plumes from the vehicles coming and going, as well as um, uh, some of the loads that we see on the arrays. So we call those, an, that's an, a, a visiting vehicle or solar array constrained event. Um, it also helps us, this, this augmentation is going to help us to fully uh, to extend the life of ISS and fully execute our full suite of research as we as we move forward, and probably most importantly, it allows allows us to power more science and research, especially in the form of future exploration systems and commercial users. The the one that I'm thinking about in particular particular would be the Axiom module that we hope to see later on um, in a few years from now on the on the front of on the front of Node Two. And of course, these resupply missions deliver science hardware and other cargo, like you were just saying, to the station. How critical are these deliveries for the station and astronauts? 
So over any six-month planning period, there are hundreds of experiments being conducted on board. Um, the vehicle that delivers our crews, you know, they or the vehicles that deliver our crews, you know, they do a great job of getting the crews there safely um, to and from station, but their cargo capacity is very limited, on the order of 100, maybe 200 kilos. Um, we couldn't conduct all the science we do as well as provide for our crew members without without our cargo resupply vehicles, which can carry about, in this particular case, about two metric tons of pressurized cargo and research. Um, our cargo flights are vital to maintaining and full, fully utilizing our orbiting laboratory. In the case of this SpaceX 22, we're bringing up about 900 kilos of research supplies to support our ongoing science program. And it will also return about 1,200 kilos of science samples and supplies for human research, biology, biotechnology, physical science investigation, and education studies. Um, the return piece of this, the science and research return, it, it can't be emphasized enough because a unique service that the SpaceX cargo vehicle provides is return cargo. Um, otherwise, the only way we can get car return cargo down in samples is on our crewed vehicles, so, uh, which again is fairly limited. Um, these vehicles also bring critical spares to help us maintain our onboard systems, keep the spacesuits maintained, and, of course, provide food, food and crew support items. So super critical to what we do each and every day. And as always, it's a busy time aboard the International Space Station with cargo vehicles and crews coming and going. One Russian spacewalk behind us and two U.S. spacewalks later this month. Can you kind of lay out how complex the next few months will be for the station program and the global partnership? Complex. Well, I hope I don't have to call it complex. Maybe exciting, fast-paced, fun times. Um, you know, we plan everything to a T and analyze it, do those kind of things. So we like to try to limit, eliminate the complexity is the way I would kind of describe it. But you're right, it's a very busy time. And so from a visiting vehicle point of view, I think the up, upcoming amount of traffic is about as busy as we've ever had. Um, there are also going to be some configuration changes, mostly on the Russian segment, that will keep our flight control, engineering, and partners very busy over the next few months. Uh, as you pointed out, we just with the completion of the Russian segment EVA, which was actually yesterday, it seems like days or weeks ago, as fast as, fast as everything is going here lately. But the Russian segment is now going to be ready for the undock of the docking compartment, which is another module that's been on board for about 20 years or so. And this opens the port up for the, the next, basically the third large module that our, that our Russian partners will be bringing to ISS. It's the MLM or multi-purpose logistics module, and that docking is later in July. You know, but before that, shortly after SpaceX docks, we'll be conducting two EVAs ourselves, one on the 16th and the other, if things go well, on the 20th of June, to install the IROSA, the IROSA arrays. Um, maybe this is where, we, where complex comes into play. Um, all EVAs are challenging. But these IROSA arrays in particular are probably probably more so than some of our other ones. And then finally, shortly after the MLM arrives uh, at near the end of July, we'll need to re relocate the crew two the excuse me the crew two vehicle from the node two forward port to the node two zenith port, which will enable the launch and docking of the OFT two um, crew demonstration vehicle. Uh, near the end of July, the first part of August. So, so yes, a very busy, exciting time for us. All right, Jeff, well, thank you so much for joining us today. And back here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room, flight controllers are monitoring the systems on the station itself ahead of Dragon's arrival Saturday morning. Again, once Dragon crosses that approach ellipsoid, which we see as an imaginary sphere around the station, flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston will begin joint operations with SpaceX teams over in Hawthorne, California. NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur will be monitoring the approach and arrival of Dragon with the planned dock Saturday morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, Central Time. Once Cargo Dragon is docked to the station, MacArthur and Kimbra will begin hatch operations to open the hatches between the International Space Station and Cargo Dragon. And again, everything is still on track in the International Space Station Flight Control Room, so that'll do it for us here in Mission Control Houston. Now back over to Kennedy. Megan? 
Thanks, Courtney. That's going to wrap up our launch coverage of NASA's 22nd SpaceX Commercial Resupply Services mission. Cargo Dragon is on course to dock to the International Space Station at about 5 a.m. Eastern Time Saturday morning. We will, of course, have live coverage of rendezvous and docking beginning at 3.30 a.m. Saturday morning Eastern Time. In the meantime, you can follow the mission at NASA.gov. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll leave you with some beautiful views of today's launch. T-15 seconds. Falcon 9 is configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Lift off. And lift off of the 22nd SpaceX cargo resupply mission, bringing new solar arrays to the International Space Station. Stage one propulsion is nominal.